Good morning and good evening, Adelaide and Fort Beaufort. Welcome to our Sunday service. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me to share the Word of God, to just be with you and to put it out there for whatever it is and just be faithful to what God has called me to. So I pray that we are truly blessed today as we share together. <clears throat> our call to worship today is taken from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your ways may be known on earth your salvation among all nations may the peoples praise you O god may the peoples praise you amen lord just thank you for that amazing psalm thank you for the blessing that it has poured out to us but in that blessing lord may we turn to you and praise you the one true living god our god Creator, Sustainer, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, just that is you. That is who you are. So, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you, and we honor you. Lord, thank you for all that you are in our lives. Thank you too, Lord, that through your Son, we have redemption, we have salvation, we have forgiveness, we have a new life, a life of abundance and joy through repentance, through forgiveness, we just come to a place of an amazing relationship that starts now and goes on for all eternity. So thank you, Lord. Bless us as we study your word today. Bless us as we just reflect on it. Um, thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for the message. Bless us, Lord, and may we bless you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading today is taken from Acts. We've been in Acts for the last couple of weeks, um, which has been quite an interesting journey. But Acts today, Acts chapter 16, verse 9 to 15. Acts 16, 9 to 15. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troyes, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Samothrace, and on the next day to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us just that far today. And we ask that the Lord bless that reading to us. Amen. Today's reading is one of those that are, it's not really a well-known passage. Um, and it's not preached about very often either. But Maybe it's because the passage is only nine, I think it's nine verses long. Um, and in those nine verses, there's so much stuff. And as much as there is, there doesn't seem that much to be said about them either. So it's a weird passage. So let's break it down. It starts with Paul having a vision. Let me ask you, anybody had a vision lately? Probably no one will put their hands up. And I'm quite sure, even if one of us had, we'd be highly unlikely that we'd say or do anything about it. After all, we're all good Christians. <laughs> and visions are not something we speak about or share about, except in the context of a mission and vision statement. But Paul has this vision, gets called to Macedonia, and without hesitation, gets ready to go, believing that the vision was from God. We then get a synopsis of Paul's journey, a trip by seat from Trios to Samothrace, then on to Neapolis, 
and on to Philippi, a Roman colony in the district of Macedonia, where they stay for a couple of days. And during their stay, the Sabbath comes, and wanting to worship, they went out of the city to a river where Luke says they expected to find a place of worship. I find that interesting that they had to go out of the city, away from the city, away from everything, to a place where they expected to find a place of worship, where they join a group of women and start to share with them. And then at last we get to meet Lydia. And once again, not much is said about her, except that she was a dealer in purple cloth, which from history we know is the most expensive cloth around, and so it is assumed that she's rather wealthy, and we also hear and read that she was a worshipper of God. And then it starts to get interesting as we get to her conversion. Luke, in rapid succession, tells us that the Lord opened her heart to God's message. Let me just pause for a moment, because I think we need to understand something here. Um, this verse speaks to the crux of salvation. It speaks to the Lord, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, opening her heart. God and God alone saves. It wasn't Paul, it was God. Paul was the conduit. God was the Savior. The next sentence, oh, let's just go back. She responds to that story, and Luke, um, Luke says she responds to God and is baptized with the rest of her family. The next sentence is the one that I want to sort of hone or, or shape my message around today. She invited us to her home, come and stay at my house. A changed and renewed heart. Something that God speaks of is in, the, is in Ezekiel 36, verse 26. He says, I will give you a new heart. Put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Which, just for interest's sake, is followed up with God bringing the dry bones to life in Ezekiel 37. Go and read it if you like. So we see this idea, this picture, the shape forming of God being salvation, God being our Savior, God changing our heart, God moving us to sanctification, to holiness, to whatever it is. God does. We believe in faith and open ourselves to the working of God. This changed heart, this new life, as Paul would say, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. And immediately on that conversion, on Lydia's conversion, we see something happen. God's gifting in Lydia's life comes to the fore, the gift of hospitality, and she invites them to stay with her. But without going into too much history or context of the situation, we need to know that this was complex. I mean, Lydia was a Gentile seeking a Jewish God. Paul had once again been raked over the coals for associating with Gentiles. The complexities of culture, religion, time, place, all factor into the story. But when we step back, we see God. We see the inexplicable conversion of, convergence of human faithfulness and divine guidance. We see God. We see human faithfulness and divine guidance meeting. And we have a changed heart and a new life. Think about it. Paul would have been guided to this place at this moment. Were he not, first of all, at God's despise? I mean, just think, I mean, let, think about it. Let's just pause for a moment. Paul had a vision to go. So without being Paul being open, without being Paul being at God's disposal, being attuned to his spirit, none of this would have happened. Lydia would not have arrived at the place or time had she not firstly been a worshipper of God, a seeker already on her way. Luke says, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. So she knew about God. She knew that the, the God of the Jews, she as a Gentile knew, but she needed that last unlocking from God when God opened her heart. 
And I believe it's at this point that we need to pause and acknowledge that without God, without Jesus, without the Holy Spirit, none of this happens. I mean, it puts a whole new spin on Revelation 3.20. When God says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So again, we see God knocking. We love because God first loved us. We see this picture of God saying, I'll knock, you open and watch what happens. So what can Lydia teach us today? Firstly, we need to stay close to the community of faith. In short, no man is an island. We need each other. Sadly, COVID-19, all its restrictions, the resurgence of it now, please stay safe, guys, have dampened our desire to meet together. In a sense, we've become so used to being isolated, we're almost fearful to almost come out into the open. But Lydia teaches us to gather with like-minded peace people to worship. The writer of the letter of Hebrews writes, let us, not, let us hold unswervingly, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day of the Lord approaching. So let's learn from Lydia. Let's get together. Let's encourage one another to get together. Let's free ourselves of our cocoons and gather together as like-minded people, with like-minded people on a regular basis. Yeah, we still have to be safe. We still need to do these things. But we have an opportunity to get together again. The second thing that Lydia teaches us is to be open to the Holy Spirit. To be ready to hear God and to respond. Walter Brueggemann notes that Lydia listened eagerly to what was new to her, even though she was a worshipper of God. I like that. Even though we are worshippers of God, are we willing, are we open to hear something new? Even though she was a worshipper, she was open to hearing. How open are you and I to hear from God, to seeing visions, to dreaming dreams? I mean, listen to Acts 2, 17 and 19. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in these days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Visions, dreams, signs, they not disappeared with the Old Testament. I think we'd like to believe that because we're fearful of making fools of ourselves. But they're there and they're live and they're real. So the challenge that Lydia places before us is open your hearts. Remove the shutters. Let the light in. Let God in. The question is, how open are we? How eager are we to listen for a new thing that God may be doing? A new direction He wants us to take. Yeah, in conclusion, finally, <laughs> the most in important thing that Lydia teaches us is to make a decision. You may be sitting here today seeking, worshipping, listening, whatever it is. But are you ready to open your heart, to open the door, to respond to God, to make a call, a decision as Lydia did? A decision that instantly produced fruit. Are we ready to make a decision that instantly produces fruit in our lives? In Lydia's case, it was fruit of hospitality. What about caring, preaching, teaching? Uh, there's 26 odd different giftings listed in Scripture. Never mind even the, the fruit of the Spirit. But I mean, the biggest question that Lydia poses is what fruit are you producing? Can people see Jesus in your life? 
Does your life, no matter what's happening around it, no matter COVID, locked in, locked out, whatever it is, confusion, anger, frustration, you name it, can people see fruit in your life? Does your life reflect love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Does your life reflect God? Amen. Let us pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, nine verses. Nine verses. Verses. Obedience. Mission. Ah, there's just so much stuff in there. But most importantly, Lord, there's Lydia. The first Gentile convert in Europe. A new life. A new hope. I mean, Lord, if we look at culture, tradition, history, fact, all the stuff that was surrounding Lydia at that time. And the minute you changed her heart, Lord, she opened her heart and said, come, stay with me. How many of us today would say, without even thinking, without even hesitation, say, come, stay with me? Lord, that's hysterical. I mean, it takes us half an hour just to unlock our house. But how would we let a stranger in? How would we welcome people? What would we do? Does our life reflect Jesus? Do we reflect the fruit of the Spirit? Do we reflect the, the giftings that you have poured into us? Lord, these are all questions that we are called to wrestle with. But I think ultimately, Lord, all you ask is that we open our hearts to the moving of your spirit. And may we do that today, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I pray that you've been truly blessed, that you know the love of God, the grace of God, the peace, the love, the joy, the everything of God. And I pray that you are truly, truly blessed to know that we have a Savior that will never, ever let us go. And so I say to us today, now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love God's will. Amen.